Well, it's good to have you. Good to have you back on. We we're just saying before I hit record, it's been two years, which is sort of crazy to me that that conversation was that long ago. But also the com- the fact the podcast has been gone that long. And you were saying you're um you're in Oregon last time we spoke. And you are you in New York or on the East Coast? Did you say right now? East Coast, yeah, down in uh, down in North Carolina is where where I'm set up now. So uh, yeah, very different, very different vibes to Oregon. That's for sure. In what sense? Uh, I would say West Coast in the US is kind of very laid back, easy going. Um, Eugene was a bit more of a quiet, small town vibe. Um, and now uh, it's we're not quite in like the Northeast here where it's the, the hustle and bustle of the of the business district and stuff. But um, yeah, you've definitely got a bit more of a of a rushed uh, a rushed community over here. The the drivers are a little a little quicker and. Uh, not not as uh not as lenient towards towards slower mm-hmm. drivers, but um no, it's it's good. We we were we spent a lot of time in Philly, me and my wife, before moving over to uh, moving over to Oregon, and and we really loved it, and um so we're we're glad to be back on the east coast, and um you know close to Angel's family and closer to a lot of friends of ours. So it's uh yeah, it's been a nice change of change of scenery, that's for sure. Yeah, nice man. I get the vibe. I uh, I was in Oregon for six weeks earlier this year. My wife's brother married an Oregon girl, so we they're in a place called Central Point, which is sort of half an hour over the border of California. Yeah, okay. Um, but we travelled up towards Eugene, went through Eugene, and uh, yeah, it's a it's a different place, isn't it? I've I'm so I I've romanticised that town so much just because of Prefontaine, and we sort of wandered through during the uh, during the World Champs and things. But yeah, the vibe I get is exactly what you've told me. Like it seems more laid back in uh, on yeah. the West Coast, but I've seen enough movies and documentaries now to get the vibe that that New York or East Coast mentality is uh, is a little more up and about. So, how long did you say you've been in North Carolina for? Uh, so I've I've been with the um, Puma Group out here for right on a year now um but officially moved out here in in november i did the drive across the country with the dog um packed up and move our stuff and um yeah so we've been we've been in our new place here for about what three months now or so um but yeah so starting to starting to get a feel for the area a bit more and and starting to enjoy it we're you know able to do little things here and there which is great What's the running situation like where you are? I didn't realize you were over there with a specific training squad. And North Carolina is yeah. not necessarily known for uh, the world of running, is it? Like that could just be my lack of education on uh, American states. But whenever I think of American yeah. running, I always sort of think of Northern Arizona uh, or Boulder, Colorado. Or, but North Carolina doesn't come up too much in the conversation unless we somehow start talking about Michael Jordan's college days. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it, you wouldn't find anyone who's traveling overseas to to have a camp in North Carolina. But um, no, honestly, it's a it's a great place for base. I mean, we've got um, the the biggest spot for us running wise is is a place called the American Tobacco Trail, which is a um, twenty two miles or what's that about thirty thirty five thirty six k, um, just a straight one way, um, and it's it's a mixture of you know, dirt path and, and cement and bike path and stuff like that. So we'll do a lot of our runs on that. And it, it's great because you can start at different points and it's, you know, if, if you can set it up so that say you had, you know, your standard run was kind of eight to 10 miles um, or, you know, 16 K or so, um, you know, you could have three days in a row where you're starting at different points and you're rarely crossing over with where you went the day before. So, um, yeah, but no, the, um, I think the biggest draw to North Carolina for us was the, um, there's three big uh, college programs around here. You've got the University of North Carolina, um, Duke University, and then North Carolina State. Um, and the, the big draw to us was one of our coaches, Amy Craig, um, trained with Shalane Flanagan. Uh, over at Bowman for for a few years, and Shalane actually went to University of North Carolina here, and so it's a lot of connections through that, and, and a lot of resources that we're able to use. Um, and we we know the coach at University of North Carolina, um, Chris Milt. Um, so that's a you know just a lot of resources for us there to be able to use, and um, also basically on the east coast works well for a group that is doing a lot more sort of road focused. 
uh, things. A lot of the big road races in the US are based on the East Coast. And so that way, traveling to meets, you don't have to travel through time zones and, and things like that. It's very easy trips to do. And um, yeah, so no, definitely, definitely not something that you would have heard of a lot of people traveling over for. Uh, we don't, we don't quite have the appeal of altitude that the, the flag staffs and boulders do, but um, yeah, no, it's, it's been a really, uh, really good area to, to set up. Yeah. So who, who are you training with? Who have you got in the, in the Puma squad? Yeah. So athlete wise, we've got, um, Myself uh, on the men's side, Patrick Dever, who's uh, was a uh, he won the twenty twenty one NCAA ten thousand meter title. He's a, he's a UK athlete who went to T- Tulsa, I think. Uh, I've probably got that wrong. I'm I'm pretty sure Tulsa. Um, Amon Kemboy, uh, who's I believe a seven forty odd. Uh, 3k guy um so and that was that was from his days at campbell university and he, he transferred to arkansas as well um ehab who's a who's a, a canadian uh 5000 meter runner he was at iona uh, in new york and sports a indoor pb i think of 1320 odd um but he's come leaps and bounds. So those three have kind of, they're our big sort of track group. And then on the distance end, um, it's myself and uh, John Dressel, who went to the University of Colorado and trained under Mark Wetmore there. And so that's a very distance oriented program. Um, I think a couple of the guys who are at the On Athletic Club were actually in the same sort of mix as, as, jo- as uh, John. Um, so he's, he's bringing over definitely that, that tough sort of mental mental side of running for us which has been great for me in the transition to the marathon um i'm trying to think if i'm missing anyone on the men's side but um but yeah and then women's side we've got a lot of women but they're they're all they're all flying at the moment uh and we've got a lot of girls who are around that uh sort of 15 flat the 15 15 mark for the 5k which is fantastic um and a, a lot of women looking to to move from the from the 5k up up towards the 10k and 10k up to the marathon so it's uh definitely a distance oriented group but um yeah we're definitely definitely a force in numbers at the moment so it's uh oh man yeah so no it's good it's good good to have options of people to people to run with on different days and then then linking up with everyone for sessions yeah i can imagine yeah it's a that's a good squad i didn't yeah so it, it always amazes me with the US, just how many athletes from around the world go over to train there? Like, obviously, as I said earlier, Northern Arizona is kind of what I think of when I say that, or even just the college system there. It's it's amazing just the attraction that it has. I guess that was your initial introduction to go into the States, wasn't it? Was that a college move? Yeah, yeah, college move uh, to, to Philadelphia, of all places. I don't think a lot of people would go to Philly for a running, running trip either. But um, once again, another city I was very pleasantly surprised with um, – when I got there and, and realized all the resources that were available as far as, as far as my running and my training went. So, um, yeah, no, I think, um, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of good setups over here and a lot of, like you were saying, a lot of, a lot of people have found, um, a home base in, in altitude spots like Boulder and, and, uh, flag stuff. But, um, yeah, there's definitely, definitely a lot of smaller groups or still large groups around at, at other sea level locations as well. Yeah. Yeah. You were saying to me yesterday when I, when I hit you up to say, Hey, let's do this podcast. You go, mate, just a heads up though. <laughs> I'm on the tail end of a, of an injury. So there's not going to be a whole heap of current running talk. Um, what's, uh, what's going on there? So you haven't been able to run as much as you'd like to at the moment. You've been navigating your way through a little, was it a stress fracture? Stress reaction. Didn't quite get to the fracture oh, stage, yeah. which was, uh, obviously that's a, that's a good thing. Um, so yes, and I've had, I've been, just nursing that back to health for the last uh since around christmas um didn't really get it diagnosed until late january though so that's kind of why the the um, recovery process has been a little longer than i think most most stress reactions are but that's okay um yeah honestly it's, it hasn't been too bad i feel like i've talked to a lot of people about who have sort of been checking in with me to see how i'm doing and this is one of the easiest injuries I've, I've come back from in the sense that you know it's the, the doctor kind of says all right yeah, this is what it is four weeks off no running and then 
ease your way back into it. And it's kind of just a straightforward diagnosis in that sense. Whereas I feel like tendons and muscles are kind of, those are the ones that get a bit tricky because then you, you know, you trial and error with stuff and ease your way back in, see how it feels. If it's, you know, it might feel a little off, but that's okay. And, and things like that. So, um, yeah, no, definitely, obviously, obviously don't wish to, wish to have bone issues, but, uh, it's, it hasn't been a, a stressful recovery process. I'll say that. Yeah. It's a good point. You make a good point around the recovery because obviously like your bones either healed or it's not. And, uh, I've yeah. been nursing or navigating my way through and obviously I'm not, I'm not trying to make Olympic teams. <laughs> I'm just trying to get out there and have a bit of fun with the running. But before I hit record, I was telling you that I'm sort of underway for Melbourne marathon training, just doing like a very, I'm running four days a week, like with a long run a session, yeah, yeah. a couple of easy runs. And uh, I went out to start a session the other day and I, I, I thought, cause I hadn't been doing a whole heap of work. Like the last couple of years for me, I'd just been going out and jogging and I'd be going to the gym, doing a bit of yoga, just like ticking all the boxes, just trying to stay fit and healthy. And then I remembered it wasn't that uncommon for me to get tight calves back in the day after a track session. And so the other day I went out to do six by a K and at the start I was like, oh, there's that tight calf feeling that I haven't had for a while. And like the smart part of my brain said, hey, mate, maybe just ease off today and, and go for a jog. And I was like, no, no, like I think this is quite normal. And then I was actually having a relatively good session, but with I was literally 900 meters into my last 1K rep. And it was just that little pinch, that little squeeze in, I think it's the gastro, the gastrocnemius, yeah, if I'm yeah. saying that right, that sort of outer upper side of your calf that just sort of pinched and I was, I was like, okay, I've had this experience enough to know that if I just try and run this last 100 metres, like every 10 metres of that, probably another day of rest that's going to need to take. Yeah, so yeah. I just um, I pulled up the pin. But you're right, like the last six months, I had no trouble with it whatsoever. But until that point, it was exactly what you said. Like as a muscle, it was very trial and error. It was very, um, do I massage it? Do I stretch it? Do I ice it? Can I run now? Can I run fast? Yeah. Whereas, as you say, with a stress fracture, it's like, all right, well, I guess I can start building my fitness back up again now. How have you? How do you find that period of? Uh, has it been four weeks completely off, or have you done cross training of any sort? Uh, yeah, been able to cross train the whole time, so that's been great. But um, yeah, I mean, for me, six to probably six to seven weeks now. I'll, I'll start easing back into running on Monday. Um, but yeah, been able to get in the pool and and swim, which has been. Uh, I haven't been too bad actually. I, I I don't mind swimming. I'm not great at it, but I, I do I do enjoy the change up uh, there. But um, yeah, I got I got a little bit of upper body weight to to get rid of when I get back into into marathon training. That's that's not going to be not going to be helpful to lug around for 42k. But um, yeah, no, it's it's been good. I've been able to get some good sessions in in the pool, and um, yeah, been working with a. Uh, with a new strength coach um, or a combination of strength coach, actually a guy I worked with um, for a while in Oregon who I'm continuing to work with and then a, a new guy down in Atlanta who's been helping with kind of more um, sort of specific weaknesses for me. So it's, um, no, it's been great. I feel like that's the combination of those things and the cross training has just added a lot of structure um, or more so kept structure in my training, which I think is easy for me personally to get out of when I when I go into a cross training mode so um yeah I think there's just a, a number of things that I've done a little bit differently during this period um of an injury than I that I haven't done in the past that's made it made it a lot easier to to cope with it and um just trying to be patient so yeah it's so true. It's one thing that I didn't realize how much I missed when I was just doing the style of training I was telling you about before, the jogs, the yoga, the gym, because I will just get up and whatever I felt like doing that day, I would do. And it might be three days of gym and then three days of running. But then getting back into that structured element of like, all right, I'm going to run on these days. It's going to be a session here. That scaffold for your week, It's I, I forgot how beneficial that was just yeah. to not only your fitness, but just your, your mindset, like to be able to get up in the morning and go, all right, today's this specific kind of day. You can get yourself prepped a little bit. It's something that I underestimated. So yeah, I can imagine just having that structure in place, even through an injury, is really important because it's I, – I don't know what it is. Like I'm not 100% sure what it is, but I used to find that when I was at uni and I had nothing on during a day, your mind would start wandering. You'd start getting bored. You'd start – I don't know. I just Maybe I was a little bit restless. But then when you had certain things in place that just had to get done on those days, you, you finished the day with a couple of ticks next to those jobs. 
and you go, oh, okay, well, it was, it was a relatively successful day. I got, I got through most of what it was that I was aiming to get through. So, so what is your, what is your weekly structure look like at the moment? Just uh, in the last seven weeks. Uh, yeah, so basically just getting one one big uh, cross training session in um, six days a week. Um, I take take uh, one of the one of the weekend days off just to just to relax and kind of um, more so just for a mental mental regroup than anything. Um, but yeah, so most days I'm I'm sort of heading to the gym around nine fifteen nine twenty. There's another another woman in our group who's injured as well and doing cross training, so that's been great for me, um, accountability wise to arrange to meet with her for for our respective sessions and stuff like that. Even if we're not doing the same thing, it's just um, good to have that. So if you're having a lazy morning, you've still got that reason to get up and go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so. Usually I'll I'll warm up, um, you know, fifteen or twenty minutes on the on the elliptical or the cross trainer, um, and then do a session in the pool, which lasts forty five to sixty minutes, depending on on what the focus is. If it's a long straight longer swim or longer reps, then it'll go the full hour. If it's shorter, like today, I was doing kind of fifties and twenty five, so that's on the shorter end time wise, but a lot more intense. Um, and then out of the pool, back on the cross trainer for 20, 25 minutes or so for a cool down. Um, and then Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, I'll go straight into um, whatever strength strength work I have that, that day that's been assigned. And that's usually a sort of 45 to 70-minute um, program depending on the day as well. So, um, yeah, I'd say all up I'm probably – yeah, leaving the house around nine and getting back twelve thirty or one o'clock, um, which is a you know it's a long stint in the morning, but I prefer it that way just to kind of knock it all out in one go and then be able to come home and relax for the afternoon and you know focus on what we're having for dinner that night. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, so what do you say? So what's what's the time factor there? So how long? What what does the pool session take? Did you say I might have missed something? You said you were in the uh, pool for about an hour. Yeah. So what are you what are you doing for the other two? Uh so warm I'm warming up on the on the cross trainer and cooling down for a combined forty oh, minutes there. Um and then the sure. gym is the gym session usually takes around an hour, give or take ten minutes. So um yes, I know it's it's good. I'm I'm kind of enjoying it. Um it's it's something that's uh a little different. Definitely looking forward to getting back into into running and incorporating that as a as the main part of my program. But um, yeah, no, it's definitely it's been good to be able to do something and not just have to kind of navigate my way through through training and like we were talking about having to feel it out or or make sure that something's not overworking and stuff like that. It's nice to just have a a set form of training that's not going to, that you know is not going to bother it and you can, you can kind of press the needle a little bit if you need to. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm good mates with a swimming coach over, over here. And uh, man, it's amazing. Cause I used to, I used to look at swimmers and I was like, mate, like what an easy job. It's, there's no trouble on your joints. There's like, it just doesn't look that hard when you're watching Ian Thorpe. And in fairness, it doesn't look that hard when you watch Ali Kipchoge either. But every now and then I'll jump in the pool to do a swim and I'm like, it's just a bit of humble pie for me because his arms going everywhere. The technical side of swimming is not something that I've really mastered just yet, but it's amazing. I always find it's amazing how much fitness, fitness you can build up just through a swimming session, regardless of how fit you are. It was, it was a shock to me when in 2014, I left the distance running scene to go and train with, with uh, Box Hill Hawks, which is just a, like an AFL. I don't know if you follow the footy. It's a VFL yep. um, footy club over here in Melbourne. And, I used to talk so much trash about footballers back in the day because I'd been disconnected with the sport for a while. And I was like, mate, I'll show these boys how to train. And I got down there and <laughs> the first couple of sessions, I was, I just could not believe how hard they worked. Like I reckon it was on the, on the edge of maybe too hard. And it was the same in the pool. Like I think there's an element for me of the technique that I'm swimming with just makes it like, I may as well be swimming with a backpack on my bag because there's something going wrong there. But do you find the same? Like you can get out of a pool and you're not necessarily sore in your joints, but you just know your lungs have just taken a massive whack. And I mean, you, you said before, like the upper body 
size that you're carrying around is maybe a bit more than a marathon runner needs. <laughs> Apart from big lungs and broad shoulders, I always feel the next day like my, my body hasn't really taken that much of a beating. I feel like the first week of starting swimming, because uh, obviously, like, I think that's the other thing that we don't really consider when you get into cross training is like the idea of you get injured and then it's like, all right, I'll just hit the bike hard or I'll just hit the pool hard or something like that. I just, I think it's so funny to think of this concept that like we go from running 24 seven to then being like, oh, okay, I can just now swim 24 seven. It's like a completely different group of muscles. It's a different like system. It's it's crazy that we just jump right in and we're like, oh, we can do this. And then we're surprised when we're sore or we can't do something or we're like, we feel unfit doing it because it's like, no, nah, bodies aren't used to that. Like we're not, we're not going to be able to do that. But um, so yeah, so the first week for me, I'm always like everything sore, my lungs, like you were talking about because of the different breathing pattern and, and things like that. Like first week's always a struggle. Um, but uh, yeah, now it's now it's starting to feel a bit more like it's not not one for one with with the same feeling as as my running training. But it's it's definitely starting to I can feel like I'm able to get more of that feeling towards it. Um, just once your body adapts a bit more to the to the motions of it and whatnot. But um, no, mate, it's fantastic. I just go to the local YMCA here, and it's uh, it's it's a very humbling experience getting in the pool and having having some elderly women uh, just glide, <laughs> gliding alongside you as you're doing a, an all out all out rep. Um, so yeah, so they're they're really really keeping me grounded, and then I'm sure I'm making them feel good by by having this young bloke who they're just flying alongside. So. Um, but yeah, so no, it's yeah, it's it's definitely um, it's something I've had to kind of navigate. But I've had you know I've had help. Alice has been been able to send me some sort of a template of of things to do, and I'm able to apply apply that to directly to the pool and and things like that. So it's um, yeah, no, it's it's been good. Um, I do think it's something I might try and keep loosely in my program moving forward like a swim once or twice a week um i feel like i always say this coming out of cross training and i'll never really stay on it but um i, th- I do think this time around I'll, i would like to more so for that because i'm realizing that that concept i talked about before where it's like if i do get injured again like you want to and i want to keep be able to get back into it then i don't want it to be as much of a shock to the system as it as it always is in that first week so um yeah, but no, definitely, definitely a different, different group of muscles, different, different aspect of my lungs are getting used. So hopefully, I can apply that to the running when we get back into it. Yeah, I remember speaking to Jen, Jen Gregson uh, uh, the first time, so a couple of years ago as well, and she was saying that as she was navigating her way through injury, she brought something similar back into her training, like a couple of her, like her afternoon runs were actually pool running sessions where she yeah. felt like she could work a little bit harder. So she wasn't swimming as such; she just had like a some flotation device around her waist and she was just cranking through the pool. Yeah. And she said the same thing, like, um, yeah, a, a lot of, a lot of that work that she got to put in without that weight bearing nature was really beneficial to her training. So yeah, I often wonder how handy that would be. And I feel like there's so much technology at the moment. Like I've seen those, I don't even know the name of it, but what does Galen Rupp run in? Uh, it's like a, an, Anti G or something oh, where it old, eliminates yeah, the old G treadmill the, takes off some yeah, percentage of your right. body weight or something. Yeah. Yeah, it just blows my mind how many options we do have as an alternative to just getting out there and running again. Um, but I guess with situations like that, you've got to have access to either really good, um, what do you say, like really good technology or just be absolutely rolling in cash and be happy to, happy just to throw it down a couple of times a week in order to, uh, in order to get it done. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's definitely an interesting concept and... Um... You know, it's it's something that I think a lot of athletes and coaches kind of struggle to manage together because uh, it's I think it's hard to find that common ground as as what the what the objective and goal is moving forward. So obviously, as a, as an athlete coming off an injury, you're going to be more you know more cautious of things. You still be very keen to get back into it, but you'll be a bit more aware of stuff. Whereas I feel like you know, as a, as a coach, you might be like, all right, I've got them back. Like now we can kind of get back into the, into the flow of things and stuff like that. So 
Um, no, it's, it's, I think it's definitely a tricky component in training. Um, especially I'm figuring that out with the marathon. It's just like, cause so much of the marathon training and build up is getting your body used to feeling like junk, you know, towards the end of a race and hitting the roads and having that repetitive motion. So if you're taking, you can't really take out some of that stuff and replace it with the non-contact sort of um mm, training component because you're taken away from something else so it's it's a, it's a tricky thing to navigate um with that sort of stuff but i think with with track running there's definitely definitely a uh, an upside to it and i think you're starting to see a lot more athletes start to incorporate it into their into their regular regime yeah so have you pretty much made a a big move away from the track now because i noticed you said a couple of times you're looking forward to getting back into marathon training is is that where you see your future now? Like, are you thinking, all right, we're going towards the marathon and that's it, or we're going to see you dance around the track a few more times? I think it was. Um, I mean, for starters, I, I just I had a really positive experience with with Chicago in October. Um, Dude, you know, what did it, you run? I completely I completely missed it. I'm I'm embarrassed to say. No, you're fine. Uh, two, it was <laughs> a tick over two eleven. So it was. Um, Oh wow! Yeah, so and that's your first marathon. That was my first one. Yeah, so I, I you know, I oh. went in. It was weird. It was kind of the first distance and race that I'd done where I went in with, like, an ideal world. I would have hit the world standard. You know, I think it was two hundred nine forty. I would have would have loved to have ticked that off and had that kind of in in my back pocket. But um, yeah, I feel like usually if I if I don't meet that sort of time goal or whatever that the main um main goal of the race is and you kind of leave a little bit you know you you might have done things right but ultimately you, you came up short um Rigi, i just i didn't feel like that this time around i felt like i came out of it and i was like that was great like i, I really i feel like i really did what i need to do i got to 30k or 32k and was was on pace and for me you know the time was one thing but it was also just like all right, let's see what the last ten k is all about because you can't simulate that shit. Like that's like, mm. like if you if you're simulating that, you're racing. You know, like there's there's nothing that's really, especially the first time you're doing it. So for me, I was like, all right, let's see what this last ten k is about. See what it feels like, and then we can start to apply that to training in an effective way. So, um, no, I, I was honestly I crossed the line and. Yeah, it would have been great to dip under two eleven, but um, no, it was it was great. I was I was really happy with it, and I kind of, you know, before it, I was really looking forward to having my time off and my break and stuff like that. But I feel like the next day I woke up and I was kind of in, in my head already thinking about what I was going to do differently in the next build up, and um, you know what I'd write down on my phone, what I'd kind of learnt from that race and what I wanted to apply to the training block the next time around and, and things like that so um yeah it was I mean that that's a one big component as to why I think I'll start to turn my main focus towards the marathon but also in a competitive sense I just think when you look at Olympic mar like Olympic races in the 10k in the marathon um like I think the marathon you can medal by closing your last 10k in like you know low 28s or something like that in the 10k at the olympics you medal by closing in like 50 anywhere from 52 to 55 um while running like 27 flat and so for me when I'm looking at that and I'm thinking in my head, like looking at what my strengths are and, and things like that, I'm like, I, I am a strength runner, you know, like that's always been something that's, that's um, come naturally to me. Like my biggest races, I've always won them based off of the strength that I've had, you know, like my first Adepec was that and, and NCAA cross was that like, didn't have these crazy big finishes and stuff like that. Um, and so when I look at doing that for 10K, I don't know how you win that race with just strength when everyone in the field can run 26.30 now. You know, like you've got to be a 26 flat guy to win that race off of strength. Um, 
so for me, I'm looking at the marathon, I'm like, maybe closing in low 28 for that last 10k is something like that sounds like something that maybe I could do. It's a, it's a long way off, but like, that's something to me that's like, that falls into my, my basket more so than closing in 52 or 53 at the end of a, a fast 10k. Um, so I think, yeah, for me, I just, because we're all in this sport to do, you know, achieve at the highest, or compete at the highest level and compete for, you know, that glory or the a medal chance and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's more so just being like, all right, that's realistically where, if, if that's what it takes to do that, the marathon is more so where I could see myself doing that than the 10K right now. So... Um, yeah, so I, I really want to get after the marathon um, now and, and see what I can do this year before Paris and and kind of see what, like how the training lead up goes, how my body reacts to it um, and if just if we see that as an event that I can I can potentially do really well at um, and you know figure that out now rather than getting towards the end of this year and being like, all right, let's just try our hand at it sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, so, no, it's, it's something I'm pretty excited about. Um, and, I mean, we've got a Brett setting the bar pretty high right now for us in Australia, which is fantastic. Um, I think we we probably haven't had as strong of a marathon um, group in Australia since, you know, since the Monteghetti and troopy and, and before that geek um so it's great to great to have someone who's setting the bar so high for us now so that you know, that's where we we've, we've got to go if we want to be you know want to be competitive in our own country let alone on the on the world stage so true it's it's true not just for the marathon it's true for like every event and in men and women like there's just so many people just tearing up the track at the moment it's blown my mind because I saw I saw Stewie run three twenty nine a couple of years ago. Yeah. I was like, "All right, Stewie's the king. No one beats Stewie over fifteen hundred. And then all of a sudden, Ollie Hall comes out and it's like, "Oh, he's Commonwealth champ, and he's gonna and like <laughs> Stewie's got to be so on his game for every race just to beat this other Aussie." So it's such a good point. And obviously, um, yeah, like I, I guess you got Jack over ten setting the ten k record. And dude, I don't know if you've been following it closely, but I saw the other day. I actually, saw it on the Let's Run. Uh, forum, which is a dangerous place to venture to. But uh, I saw, I think his name's Cam Myers, like a 16 year old Aussie kid, ran 340 for 1500. I think I saw the other day. And it was yeah, like that popped up on my uh, Instagram, I think, the other day. It's like half a second off Ingebrigtsen's age world record. And I know, like, you're still sort of 10 seconds off being where you need to be if you want to be relatively competitive internationally. But I think as a young fella, dude, like when I was competitive, I ran 349. Um, and I was happy with that. But I think I was 22. And there weren't that many people in Victoria running that much faster at the time. That was like 2011. I mean, you had a couple of blokes like Geordie Williams and um, and things sort of running around 338 at the time. But it's amazing to me that you look that, like you can't run 337 and be a competitive 1500 meter runner no. at the moment in Australia. It's just, no. it's unbelievable. You've got, because the way Cam ran that race as well, he ran 340, but... I just watched the last 700 and he led the whole way yeah. and he just, and then with about 400 to go, speaking of strength running, like he just, <laughs> he just seemed to, he just seemed to kick by himself and run away from the field, which was, which was really mind blowing. It's, yeah. it's really interesting that point you make about strength running as well. I can see just having watched quite a lot of your races, how, how that would be true. And it's unbelievable that like when you, when you say you, you kind of do need to be a 26 man <laughs> to be competitive yeah. over the last lap of a, 10k to international race mate you got to close faster in the 5 or 10 than you do on the 15 now the fi- I, I love watching the 15s now because it's um obviously having you know having slower races and this final last lap being a dash for the finish is exciting and and whatnot but um like you're just talking about i mean that young fellow just ran 340 but i'm sure he's looking at guys like stewie and ollie who were just out there and just throwing balls to the wall like they're running 329, 330 on a regular basis, and they're not closing in 52. They're closing in 55 or 56, and they're starting in 57. You know, it's just 
they're just fucking going for it. And it's awesome to see that, like, it's, it's great. I mean, you see it on the men's side, but you also got the women's side as well. I mean, mate, that 4 by 2 k at World Cross, I will be tuning in to watch that because that, that is – because we were looking at the uh, – I was looking at the teams for that, and that's probably one of the very few teams that are lining up where you've got four world-class 1,500-meter runners. And it is going to be awesome to see that. I mean, Jess is what, 358, 359, um, 1500. Abby's 403 or something like that. But she's, how old is she? Is she like 17 or 18 or something crazy? Is that, um, oh my God. Yeah, it's mind blowing. It's insane. And then you've got Ollie, 330, come games champ. And um, not even 330, they're both 348, 347 mile guys. Like, <laughs> and the crazy thing is, is we've been talking about the strength of the Australian 15 and we haven't even mentioned Jai Edwards around 349. And Matt Ramson's a yeah. 333 guy and he doesn't even come to the comp. Like, it's crazy the strength of this, uh, of, of Australian middle distance and, and distance running right now. And it's, um, it's awesome to see, you know, it's, it's great. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's good to see us. I feel like we've had guys who have, um, kind of had had big moments in the past like obviously craig was was phenomenal and, and like we mentioned before like minor and, and lee and their uh, truth and their times and collis benny saint um but it's it's awesome to have such a large group now all competing at the same time doing it um i'm sorry i've, I've missed out a big one in gregor there but it's um but yeah, it's no, it's great to see that we finally got kind of like all everything from like the eight hundred up is is in a really good place, right? Not even just for right now, but for the for the next five to ten years, which is amazing to see. Yeah, mate, you mentioned the eight. It's uh, it's it's weird at the moment looking at Pete Bowl over here. I'm not sure what to make of that situation. I don't know how well you know Pete, but it's kind of it's kind of one of those situations where you look at it and you're like, I don't I don't think this is legit. Just yeah. based on how good a bloke he seems to be, it just I seems know, off. it just yeah. seems off. And yeah, I don't I don't know many many of the details of the situation, but from my personal experience with Pete, he's a phenomenal bloke, and um, I agree with you that it would be very hard to see see something like that um, actually actually playing out the way it, the way it's been. Um, you know, the way that it has. Um, and so, you know, i got nothing but respect for, for Pete as, as a bloke and as an athlete, and so I'm hoping that, that, it, that it gets sorted out and we can see him back on the track uh, in action very soon because I think what he's done for the sport um, in the last couple of years has been incredible. So it would it would mm. be great to be able to get him back out there and, and continuing on what he's, what he's been able to build. Um, yeah. So true. Everyone who talks about the bloke says exactly that. Like he's a he's a ripper, like the best bloke going yeah. around. So I'm just hoping I'm hoping we get some good news on this B sample and, and uh and you know, hopefully we can say the poor bloke just has, has been through hell for a for a month. But I guess yeah, I guess time will tell. But mate, you were um you were saying something before that I wanted to tap on before I forget. You said that at the end of your Chicago marathon you wrote down a couple of things in your in your iPhone about just potential areas of improvement. I was just I was keen to pick your brand around what they were like what were a couple of takeaways that you left going hey we could we could really see some progress here yeah i think the biggest thing for me that kept coming up was just the fact that um you know my, my body kind of gave out before my fitness did um you know it was a weird race in the sense that i crossed the line and usually you you feel you're out of breath and you're hunched over and stuff like that but um my breathing and my aerobic system were actually pretty good um like i i didn't feel flat out sort of at the end but for me it was more so once i hit that probably around 35k i would say my quads started to get really sore really heavy uh, my calves started to get pretty like pretty seasy um and it was just kind of like i was pushing and like running as as hard as I could, but it was just something where my legs couldn't match what was going on up here. Um, so it was a it was a weird situation. I feel like the, if there's a 
the doctors at Athletics Australia will be freaking out because that's probably what happened in Tokyo, but a very different story. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's um, no, it was weird. It, it was just kind of like I could just slowly feel all my all the sort of muscles and fibers in my quad just starting to be like, all right, we've been running on the road for a long time now, and we're not we're not really used to this. So, um, so that's that's been a big one for me that I'm that I'm taking away and trying to really work into my um, next build up will be just to try and really callous my legs for the distance um and and kind of be able to go through try and replicate that feeling in a way and and find a way to you know i don't want to say push through it but find a way to manage it um sort of thing as the race goes on so that it's not a hindrance to the to the pace uh, that i'm running um and so yes, a few ideas we've had for that is you know having having my easy days be a little a little bit faster than they than they were before, or you know having at least one or two uh, longer runs just on pavement each week and and stuff like that. Mm. Um, also incorporating some you know maybe a, a bigger strength day the day before a session where I'm I am lifting a bit more with with my quads and my glutes and, and things like that so that they're going into the day a little tired and I'm having to having to figure out how to navigate that. So um, that's what I mean. It was just, it was a very, um, I don't know, it was like I was trying to take notes that last 10K um, and, and really figuring out, all right, what's, how do we how do we figure this out next time around? Um, yeah, I didn't I didn't leave kind of clueless and wondering what happened, what went wrong. It was more so like, all right, this is what went wrong, and it and it feels like something that I can I can work on and and definitely be have it altered for the next time around. So um, yeah, so so that was a big one. Um, yeah, and then, uh, like I said, I, I felt like I was fit enough to run quicker than I did. Um, obviously, I didn't get to fully test that. Um, I didn't get to fully test that because my, my legs gave out on me a little little earlier than, than anticipated. But, um, yeah, the, the fitness was, was there, I think. It was just a matter of, of um, you know, getting my body a little more beat up beforehand. Um, what was another note? Uh, not having a wedding five or six weeks beforehand, we won't do we won't do that again. Even though it was a lot of fun, and Angel, I don't... Angel will be happy to hear that as well. She'll yeah. be real happy to hear you not have another wedding before your next yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, <laughs> don't, don't regret any of it. But I think we're, it won't be a won't be a must for the next marathon build. Um, but yeah, but no, otherwise, um, otherwise, I think it, it was a really good and successful first first build up and first first crack at the event so um yeah no just looking forward to getting the opportunity to to have another have another go at it and and see what we learn from that one it's a weird balance isn't it because i when you were explaining just what you felt like that last 10k that was sort of going through my mind as well because i noticed even though i was running about an hour slower than you for my marathon it was just the just that unforgiving nature of the road and like the idea of getting it, it's a weird balance because obviously you, you want to try and navigate the, just the impact of being on the road with the um, forgiving nature of being able to train for long miles yeah. and fast on gravel. But you're right. It's uh, it makes so much sense. The thought that that's potentially an approach. So with the first marathon, I know you said during those, or through those tobacco fields or tobacco trail, you've got miles and miles to run on. Is, is that pretty much where you were doing that longer, fast workout through there? And, and were you getting much of an opportunity to run on concrete or run on sort of just road? Because the idea, it, it sounds counterintuitive in a way that you're like, all right, well, I want to make sure my body gets to the race in really good form. Yeah. But then if you get into the race with really good form and soft legs, it's like, okay, well, that's not that's not a win either. Yeah, no, I think um, there were a lot of runs we were doing there, but they were more so... There was never a day that was just pavement. I think a lot of days were kind of a mix of, of pavement and trail. Or if I was doing shakeouts, they were they were on the trail and, and things like that. Um, my longest run that I did in the build up was all on a trail. So that's that's another thing coming away that I'm like, all right, that 
probably would have been beneficial to have done that on on a hard surface and and maybe that kind of would have simulated yeah. that feeling a bit more. Um, how how far was that run, Pat? Uh, what was it? It was maybe forty three or forty four k. So not too far. Oh wow! Not too far over distance, but it was like two hours forty five. So it was more. A, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it was more a time thing for for us than than the distance. So, um, yeah, that that was the longest run I did, and and my when I did it, my main focus was making sure I was getting my drinks and able to get enough fluids in and stuff like that. And so that was good. Like that wasn't an issue during the race, which was a big concern for me going in. So that was, that was a great thing that I think I navigated well and, and know how to do going forward. But um, yeah, so now it's kind of like, all right, well, you did that well, but if you'd have put that run on a bike path or on a road and done it that way, then that might have been more effective sort of thing. So um yeah so that that was definitely one thing we did a altitude stint for the five weeks before the marathon uh up in mammoth lakes in california um a lot of the runs are on trails up there as well so that that's another thing where i'm like all right well I'd, if we did that again i'd kind of have to figure out a road loop or some sort of more road focused runs because a lot of the longer runs we did there were sort of at least 50 percent trail if not more so um yeah so there was little things like that that i was like all right like it makes sense that my legs gave out on me like that like it's it wasn't something i was thinking about at the time but now now that i look back on it i'm like yeah that checks out that they wouldn't have been that they would have got to sort of 20 miles and said all right mm. we're out for the day um, <laughs> yeah we'll catch you next time around but um but yes, yeah, so no, it was good. Like I said, just a lot of a lot of things that the things that went wrong made sense at the end. Like why they went wrong was was pretty clear. So it was like, all right, we can. That's something we can work on. I feel like it's when you get to the end of a race and you're like, I don't know what the fuck just happened. That's when it's like, <laughs> that's when you're like, all right, this is that's pretty tricky to navigate. Like because I feel like I did everything right and then it went wrong. Those are the days that are tough, whereas this one was pretty easy, uh, pretty easy to figure out why things went the way that they did. Yeah. With that longest run that you did, did you say, was it 40, 45K, did you say? Just, 43? just under, yeah, 43 to 44. It was 26 and a half mile. I think 26.2 is oh. marathon distance. So, yeah, it would have been about 43. And and how long before your actual race day was that? That was, uh, that was right before I went up to altitude. So, that would have been five to six weeks out i think um and then yeah okay. be, between that run and the marathon i did another couple of two and a half hour runs i think so I'm probably closer to mm -hmm. like 30 between 35 and 38k yeah uh yeah so um but yeah like i said only the one so that that's another thing that we'd probably we'd probably do a little differently this time around is maybe try and get two or three of those those longer runs in um maybe even incorporate a bit of a, a session into into one of them as well so um yeah so no definitely yeah definitely a lot of things that, that we learned in this build up that we do we know that what we're going to change about it uh, next time around it's such an art form eh? like it said it feels weird throwing that out i'm listening to a book by um, i don't know if you know rick rubin the music producer called the creative oh, yeah, act yeah. And he just talks about, he just talks about like the most, he, he talks about so many different things that people do um, that they don't call art, which actually is art. Yeah. I was listening to it on the way home from, from doing stand up comedy last night and I couldn't stop thinking about running and, and not just the act of being out there actually running, but even the preparation phase that we're speaking about now. And like, what else do you call it? Cause there's so many different strokes and colors that you can add in, which makes such a massive impact. And it's, it, it's sort of even more obvious just hearing you talk about an event like the marathon. I know other events and you know better than anyone just how how different the training styles can be but the marathon seems to be in a league of its own because there's some people who like the longest run they'll do is 32k yeah. and that's why i was surprised to hear that you went out and above the distance i think i heard that paul turgate used to do like 50k runs yeah sometimes in in like anticipation or in in the lead up to a race um 
so you were kind of like with that with that forty five k or that forty forty three k run twenty six and a half miles. With that one, were you going out there with the anticipation of like, all right, okay, I'm going to run for two hours forty five? And did you have a sort of certain idea about how far outside of race pace you wanted to go for that? No, I mean, I I didn't really have a focus on pace. Um, for me, it was more so yeah two two forty five. Um, I think the pace kind of came naturally because. I was doing it by myself because um, I was back. I was We just had our wedding. We were traveling back to, to Eugene for a week where we still, Angel was still living out there. And so we were spending a week there together before I went to um, went to altitude. And so um, for me, I was just like, I, was, I did it around Priest Trail actually, um, no, which, is, which is, uh, yeah, it was it was a challenging one mentally. It's it's because it's just a four mile loop. So I think I ended up doing like six laps of that or something. But um, for me, I was just like, if I'm going to get through this. I can't look. I can't look at my watch. Like I can't. I can't look at it and see how long I've got left or or anything like that. So I kind of figured out in my head um, when would be like a safe time to look at the time just to make sure you know i wasn't going over or anything like that and so in my head i was like if i look at five laps that'll be like if i'm having a really good day it'll be right around 220 and i'll have one lap to go if i'm having an average day it'll be close to like 230 and i'll just like have to do a little a shorter loop or like an out and back or something like that so that was kind of like my thing was i'm just going to get through five laps and then see where i'm at um, and not really worry about the pace, just run it off the field and, and focus on the on the drinks, like I was saying. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I got to the end of five laps and I was, turns out I was having a good day and was right on uh, 220 um, for, for that. So I, I finished off one more lap and, and dropped to, yeah, it, it, I definitely, when it got to the last five minutes and I saw what the distance was at, I was like, oh, yeah, I can get over the over the distance here and, and make that a a good thing to tick off mentally but um but yeah it's it was more so yeah just one of those things where the 245 i knew regardless of whether i ran the distance or not that was going to be the indicator for me if i can get through that okay then like the actual marathon distance isn't going to be an issue for me um which yeah. was definitely a concern you know when you when you're a 10k when you used to run in 10ks and your furthest race at the half marathon and that seemed, seemed like a long way like when you're preparing for a marathon it's like yeah it's weird to think that like finishing the race is a is a feat in your head when you're doing it it's not a feat when it comes to the actual day like when it came to the actual day i was like all right i have ambitions and things i want to do i'm ready for this and, and the distance isn't an issue but definitely at stages during the build-up you're like I've got to be pretty fit just to finish this thing. So I've got to make sure that I do something that just kind of reminds me that like, all right, the distance isn't going to be a problem. You'll be fine in that regard. You now move past that bullshit and, and figure out how you're actually going to race this and, and do it well. Yeah. And, and outside of your, so did you have a, a like a 16, 18 week build up to actual race day? It was, we did, uh, 12 weeks of like focus stuff but i'd been i'd raced we'd been preparing through a little bit of a track season before it so you could look at it as like a 16 week build up but the actual marathon focus training didn't start until sort of 12 to 10 weeks out yeah 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 awesome man no that's unreal it's such an interesting event i mean we could have a podcast just on the marathon in itself, but I, I told you I'm not going to hold you up all evening because I know it's getting uh, it's getting later into oh, the evening there, and you and Angel got to go cook some dinner, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it is crazy though. I mean, that was something because I was talking to uh, I was I was having a little uh, text conversation with with Brett before it, um, sort of in the weeks before because he was getting ready for was he getting ready for London? I think at the time. Um, and I was just kind of like, I had some, I was just kind of bouncing some things off him because I was like, I just want to make sure this is normal, like sort of the headspace or the, or the training that I'm going through and stuff like that. And um, yeah, he responded back to me. He was like, it's crazy, man. Like the marathon's like a completely different sport 
like it's not just a different event it's a different sport to the rest of track and field and i was like yeah that's to the rest of track i should say so, you know, fields are i think fields are a different sport in itself and that should be respected in that way but it's um but yeah it's uh it's crazy it's it's just like i feel like we have this sort of just basket that we call athletics but inside it realistically there's three different sports that we're just throwing into the same same category um so yeah it's it's nuts but um but yeah definitely yeah it definitely took it took that kind of approach of being like all right this is something that's completely new i've got to be able to prepare myself for that and kind of you know toss aside a lot of what you know keep the base like the basics and the things that you know work for you but you know you kind of have to be prepared to learn learn the ropes again with, with stuff so um yeah so no it's exciting um yeah yeah but no it's uh it, it was a good good experience looking forward to the next one yeah awesome man oh well, dude it's uh it's good to finally touch yeah. base with you again i appreciate you coming back on and sharing all your all your insights i know there's going to be uh there's going to be thousands of athletes out there listening who are going to be uh who are going to be really inspired and, and motivated from it so i appreciate it brother oh, i hope so mate i hope so that we'll uh yeah no anytime tyson appreciate you having me on mate um yeah we'll have to we'll have to talk again before two years is up next time around <laughs> yeah all right i'll make sure i i'll make sure i hold I'll, you to I'll, it I'll, be good. I'll have to give you something to actually send me a message about in order to make it interesting so that you can hold me to that <laughs> for the next 18 months <laughs> no nah, awesome brother Mate, I'll leave you to it. Thanks again, and uh, we'll, we'll see you next time.